Welcome, comadres and friends. I am Dr. Nora de Hoyos Comstock, national and international founder of Las Comadres para las Americas. The leadership team and I are so pleased to have you join us for tonight's teleconference as we celebrate our book club's quinceañera. It has been our privilege to support Latino authors throughout these many years, and we look forward to the next 15 years. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome to readers following us on our live Twitter chat. Tonight, please help us welcome authors Silvia Velasquez Lavado and Adriana Hernandez Herrera. Pardon. The interviews will begin shortly. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. Please keep yourselves on mute. You can keep your videos on. We suggest you put yourself on speaker mode but gallery works just as well. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat and we will try to get to them. But first, let's start with our book club's history. Comadre Tess. Hi, I'm Tess Tobin, submissions coordinator for the book club. Our first book club gathering was in July, 2004 in New York in Comadre Maria Frere's apartment. After our hiatus, Nora Comstock re-envisioned and re-launched the book club nationwide to promote the work of Latino authors to every book lover, to bring our community to bookstores and to support our writers. We started our teleconferences in October of 2006. We are in our 15th year of sharing works by Latino authors with all of you. We've created the teleconferences and book club to entice everyone to read more Latino authors and to learn about Latino roots and the different perspectives on Latino culture and heritage. Our book club and teleconferences are open to all, not just Latinos. We are creating a space for everyone to explore the Latino writer's mind and soul as portrayed through the written word. We encourage you to join our local book club in your city or time zone. We have clubs in 12 cities that are meeting virtually. There is sure to be one that can fit your schedule. If your city doesn't have one, why not help us start one? For more information about our book club, visit our website at latinolit.com. So please invite others to join us. Comadre Karen. This is Karen Gonzalez, Assistant Coordinator for the Las Comadres and Friends Book Club, Denver Comadres Book Club Facilitator and Co-Founder of the Colorado Alliance of Latino Mentors and Authors. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight, we begin with our interview with author Silvia Vasquez Lavado. In 2016, Silvia became the first Peruvian woman to reach the summit of Mount Everest in Nepal. By 2018, she completed climbing the seven summits otherwise known as the tallest mountain in each continent, becoming the first openly gay woman to do so. Sylvia is a role model for anyone who has been told that their identity comes with limitation. She is a fierce advocate of LGBTQ plus equality and women's rights and sexual abuse survivors. Sylvia's achievements made her be recognized as a leader on and off the mountain and a symbol of women's empowerment worldwide. Interviewing her is Comadre Nilda Viepa, a board member of the Florida Writers Foundation, which promotes literacy in the state of Florida. She was also leader of the Maitland Writers Group and the author of the award-winning book, Alborada, a poetic memoir across cultures. Comadre Nilda, take it away. Hola, hello everybody, and especially uh, welcome to Sylvia. And I'm very uh, excited and feel very privileged to be talking to you and asking you uh, a lot of questions that have been in our hearts since we started reading your wonderful book. Uh, it's a very inspiring book. And, and we're also very proud that you completed the seven summits. So um, I am, I'm very happy to, to uh, be here. Oh. And I, I was gonna say, Nilda, thank you so much. I mean, my heart, it is, it has the biggest smile right now, especially being con being in this book club with las comadres. I mean, that word, you know, just uh -huh. it, it brings me home. It does bring me home. It was it was such a special work growing up. 
listening to my mom, the interpretation, the kindness of it, and, and it is an, an amazing honor. So thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Um, well, I, I want to start with, with the title of your book. Um, I was curious about it. And then I, I saw this quote where you say, the shadow of the mountain was the only thing big enough to sh sh swallow my shadow. Um, yes. And I, I want you to talk to us a little bit more uh, about this, this aspect of, of sh swallowing your shadow. I can't speak today. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, this to me has been a magical journey and I have to, to share that as a Latina woman, even more proud. I mean, and the pride and, and just the, the opportunity of being able to reach out uh, because I, I know Latinas, it doesn't matter what country we we'll, we'll come from. We have this, this connection already. There is this powerful sisterhood that, that unites us. And there's a lot of values that, that bring us together that I think it just, it goes, it goes back you know, to, to our roots. It goes back to the different cultures that were in our country before we got colonized. Um, but you know the irony of, of the of the title of in the shadow of the mountain and for me particularly the significance of it I've spoken very openly I mean the book is about my journey as a survivor of sexual abuse and unfortunately the pain and that that the tag and the labeling just left a horrible stigma in my life I became an alcoholic in my twenties and I was literally self destroyed my life I was in this path of sabotage. And it was until my mother, out of, all, out of all people who was living in Peru, asked me to come down to Peru and do a powerful session of ayahuasca with her uh, in which I was able to reconnect to that little inner girl in my life that, had, that I had been trying to destroy. And as I reconnected as in my vision, I see my little girl, I see myself as an adult. And as we come together, these valleys open up and my little girl takes me walking among the valleys. And so with that vision, I put this, you know, this dream into action and I took myself to the base of Everest. I have never been a hiker. I had never hiked in my life for more than a couple of hours. Um, if, if, if I ever went to on a camping trip, I would drive to the campsite camp and then drive away. I, I was never really inspired by nature, and so when I decided to take myself to the base of Everest as a way of trying to bring the biggest pain in my life to the, to the base of the tallest mountain in the world, the day that I saw the Himalayas for the first time, which was on my second day in that journey, that is when my life changed because it was for the very first time that I saw my place in the world. I was this tiny little minuscule speck surrounded by these powerful mountains and everything inside of me just it gave me the perspective of me in the universe. It showed me that my problems, it showed me that every single thing, every label, anything that I call myself was nothing in comparison to these mountains. And what the mountains gave me were a sense of protection, a sense of connection, a sense of embrace of safety that I had never experienced with any human. And, and so that is what literally led me to the perspective of, of me calling my journey in the shadow of the mountain, because against the shadow of the mountain, you know, I, you know, I mean, like anything that we have that we think it is swallow, so swallowing us whole has nothing in comparison. I mean, you know, mountains, nature are, mountains and nature are welcoming. They are ready to, you know, they, they can give us, I mean, to me, it gave me my courage, it gave me my strength back and, and you know, the power of this journey. Yeah, I can relate to that because uh, I, was, I grew up in Puerto Rico and uh, lived in El Paso, Texas for several years. And then when I moved to Florida, I felt so forlorn and so abandoned and I couldn't tell what it was. And it was just the fact that there was no mountains around me, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and I realized that, that the mountains gave me that sense of security. So I, I can understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I can relate to is um, to what your mother was going through. I am the mother of a uh, bisexual daughter and I am uh, the mother of a, a daughter that was abused when she was three years old. And I didn't find out about it until she was like in her mid thirties. Mm. And when I heard about my, my bisexual daughter, 
I was so entrenched in the way I was raised and the things that I, I was taught that I really couldn't understand. I didn't know how to mother her. I didn't know how to 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 be the the good influence that she needed. And you know, as the years have gone by, uh, we have grown in our relationship, and and now uh, we're doing very well. But you talk about how difficult your relationship was with your mom and how she loved you, but couldn't accept that you were gay and struggled to discuss your sexual abuse with you. And you were even estranged for a while. So can you talk us, to us about, have you forgiven her for not being able to protect and understand you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if anything, the book has been an ode to my mother, um, you know, to, to my love and, and I, I felt it was a privilege to be there holding her hand when she passed away. I, I, I know for many of us who's lost loved ones, it's a very hard time um, and, and it can be quite traumatic and, and losing her, um, it was one of the biggest heartaches I, I had to experience. Um, and I also needed to accept who she was, where she was coming from. I think as I, as I, as I work hard on accepting myself, um, I also, you know, kind of didn't, almost didn't care about her as in a sense like, you know, her not agreeing with me wasn't not gonna change who I was. I mean, it hurt that she couldn't accept me. Uh, and I know she tried, I, I thought it was comical. I didn't put it on the book, but when, when she died on her wake, we had over a thousand people that joined. And at the time my ex-wife was with me, and many of the people were like, oh, that's your brother's wife. And I'm like, no, that's my wife. And they're like, wait, you? I'm like, yes, I'm gay. So I was having my coming out party at her wake. And I'm just looking at my mom. I mean, her casket is there. And I'm just going like, I love you, mom. You're funny. I mean, you know, so I thought that could be, that could eventually be a funny episode. Um, but I also, you know, for me, I think I needed to understand the culture and that is what it is so important for me right now to almost kind of call myself an ambassador being these openly gay women proud I mean the, the book is coming out in Spanish at the end of the year and I can wait to bring the message all over Latin America because there's such a stigma mm -hmm. uh, and and I think the only way to break that stigma is for me to be able to speak out loud about it to be able to to just show people that there's no difference that you know I mean and so I, I have to understand that the society in my country, the way that it was, you know, made my mom who it was. There were no real, mm -hmm. um, there were no, no powerful stories or compelling stories about gay women. It was always like even gay men, they usually were the hairdressers or the people working mm -hmm. in the beauty industry. And, and even the way that society portrayed them, it was almost too, I mean, it was a mockery. Um, but, but that is part of my role right now. I think this opportunity for me, I call myself, you know, just as there's, I mean, so many of you have been, have broken through much of the glass ceiling. I mean, I'm an icebreaker. I literally climbed through ice. So I am here doing that. I am with my ice picks and this beautiful journey to be out loud and proud is for me to allow others to be able to come after me and just to hopefully open people's hearts. That's wonderful. Oh. Well, uh, I wanted to, to ask you, uh, what made you realize that you needed to bring other survivors of sexual abuse to Everest, that, that your own healing depended on their success as much or more as their, theirs did? Beautiful question, beautiful question, Nilda. I mean, I had put that very first time in 2005 when I went to the base of Everest and I, I remember seeing the sunrise and being so inspired and making the promise to return one day and to come back with a social cause I remember clearly, and, and it actually still gets into my body. I, I had no idea what it was gonna be. And even I was so very at early stages of my own acceptance of actually really embracing, um, you know, being able to speak out loud about being a survivor. And, and I spent a long time trying to figure out what it was going to be. It almost was is I was trying multiple different types of shoes. Like, you know, is this gonna be this particular cause, this and that? And, and it was literally, that's what it is so funny when I, and I shared on the book, when I climbed the Concagua in, at the end of 2013, just as my mother had died. And after I had just lost, uh, after I had just gotten divorced, 
Um, and, you know, in, in the tallest mountain in my continent, in Latin America, South America, I, I get the voice, I get, I get the instructions very clearly that I needed to bring survivors of sexual abuse who, like myself, needed to have an opportunity to reconnect to nature the same way that I did. And, and that is, I mean, and I remember prior to that, I had been struggling. What was going to be that cause? And I was even, I had so much self-doubt about if I needed to continue pursuing this journey of climbing, because I had, I mean, I hadn't climbed in many years. I had barely done two of the seven summits. And so there was so much uncertainty. And I felt that after summiting Aconcagua, in which it was the very first time I was able to leave a photo of my mom at the top and, and being in, in my own continent, um, you know, to hear that voice in my dream say, you need to bring survivors. And just being that specific, just it felt, okay, I gotta, I gotta follow this. Even though putting that into action was harder because, you know, here it's, it's like, how do you operate from a dream? And, and what are, what are, you know, how do I know if this is going to work? Uh, and that is the beautiful journey that I'm, I'm now more convinced and I'm trying to as well inspire others just that is that intuition, that gut feeling, if it comes from a place of your heart, if it comes from a place in which you are open, trust, that is the voice of wisdom. That is the voice of the almighty, of the virgin that is channeling into us. And so, and that's been magical. I mean, and even though, even though bringing the idea and then trying to work with girls, you know, what's his own journey. And for me, because I didn't know if this was going to work, it was so important um, you know, to really tie the whole success of even trying to attempt Everest to the safety of these young women. Uh, because for me, this was not so much about just a checkbox. I mean, and, and this is a one aspect, even on my current nonprofit as I work with women, it's not about quantity. Each, each person's lives matter. And, and so that's what it was so important. And, and I feel that's what it was so special to share that journey in the book as how the trip is going with the girls, because as you can tell, I mean, for all of you who have had children and almost working with young teenagers, it's not easy, it's hard. And there was no guarantee. And, and so many times we were ready to quit. So um, I felt it was really magical. And, and, and I feel myself very blessed that, you know, we all made it safe. The, you know, everybody had the most incredible journey and, and I'm able now to share it to the world. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry if you hear my little dog getting in the way. I'm muting myself when she gets a little <laughs> demanding. Anyway, um, so uh, we hear you're working with Selena Gomez to bring your life story to the main screen. How's that going? Uh, will there well, be a movie out this year? No, actually, we just got the script. So we are still baby steps. I'll tell you what is coming sooner. I filmed a show with Hillary and Chelsea Clinton as part of their oh. Gutsy series. So I'm going to be one of the Gutsy women that is getting featured next Friday, September 9th, and it's going to be shown on Apple TV. Uh, oh. And, it's, and I, I have a, the opportunity of taking them on a little adventure, so I can't spoil that too much, but it will be fun. Oh. I, I am joking that if Hillary or, or Secretary Clinton, if she wouldn't be, you know, who she has become, she would have been a damn mountaineer. Like she, she, she was, she came alive. It was so amazing to see her excitement when we were talking yeah. about nature. Um, but that is coming up uh, very soon. For, for the film, I had the opportunity of actually meeting Selena just recently. I went to her 30th birthday party and, you know, she, what an outstanding young woman. Um, it's, uh, we have just received the first draft of the script and for all of you, because I know there are many writers here, you never publish a book on your first draft. So we are going through the rewrites. Um, it's, uh, it's a, it, you know, the book is pretty long. So a lot of things have to be cut out and I'm having a meeting in LA in a couple of weeks to start working on the second um, kind of the, the opportunity of, of doing the, the, all the adjustments and, and trying to bring it. What I'm, what I'm thrilled about uh, this opportunity and, and as well working with Selena is the powerful um, you know, impact of the story. Yeah. We have so much, I mean, we have the opportunity of rewrite shame um, you know, and, what, and, and, 
you know, having a, having a very strong, having a, how can I, how can I describe Selena? I mean, a young, a woman that, a young woman that has been working since she was six years old, who is fearless, who is vulnerable, who is not afraid to open up to some of her, her most uh, challenging times. And, and so we wanna make sure that we have the opportunity of write a very powerful story um, something that that you know also brings justice that 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 is fair um, that we can portray you know the but portray my mom portray her pain portraying the challenges in a way that it helps you know awaken the coin the the conscious of people um, so it's it's going to be a little journey we if 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 you know if we have our varita magica and and if I have the guidance of the Virgin and 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 toda mis madrinas. I mean, hopefully next year we can start filming. So, but but it's very exciting. I mean, I, I find myself incredibly grateful because it's it's not an easy opportunity, you know, to to share this story. I mean, I, I kind of joke that I feel I'm I'm on my own gay Cinderella version of life. I mean, I, <laughs> I never. I mean, and I'm not, but I'm not looking for any Prince Charming for sure. But uh, I I am, you know. Just, just surrendering to this journey to be able to bring a powerful message that hopefully can inspire young women, young boys around the world, especially you know in our community, in our culture. So, so we'll see. But, but yeah, we're we're moving little by little, step by step. That's great. Um, so, so that kind of ties into the the question that that uh, what what meant for you when you realized that you were the first openly gay woman to climb Mount Everest and complete the seven summits, how did that impact you? I think, you know, even when I came across, uh, I, I mean, and when I even started climbing mountains, I never, you know, I mean, I, I, I imagined there would have been a, a, a hardcore, you know, kind of tougher woman, more like on the butch side that had done it. I mean, uh, especially living in San Francisco, I, I have so many friends who are, who are tougher than me. And, <laughs> and so I remember I was on my first attempt to Denali when I found out that I would be the first openly gay woman and it surprised me. I'm like, oh, I thought there were others. And, and the more that I started uh, getting involved in mountaineering, I just saw, wow, this is really very um, kind of almost close, not close-minded, but it is is very much male-oriented, you know, Caucasian male. and. And so I saw it as an opportunity to, to just be able to open up the door to others. I mean, it's at the end of the day, when I look at when I even migrated to this country, I mean, the very first woman, um, I think I had just moved here in 92 when the Clintons had just won the White House and seeing Hillary being such, um, you know, you know, such a dynamic first lady, almost rewriting the role of a first lady was, was very impactful. And, and so for me to now have the opportunity to become the role model for others is an honor. I think it, it's all, you know, I'm just the first, I don't wanna be the last and I'm not trying to be the last, we need more. And, and so it is my duty now to mentor others, to try to keep inspiring others and more important to make uh, being in the outdoors more accessible because there's still a big stigma. I mean, on high mountaineering and a lot of expeditions. So that's part of my role. That is something that I'm trying to show, not only um, you know, the way that you can, you can grow so much, become more courageous, really rely on yourself when you're in expeditions, but also to show the benefits, even in mental health. You know, timing nature allows you to clear out so much clutter that sometimes we have that prevent us from really, you know, being able to achieve what we want. Um, so, so it's 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 you know it's it's a beautiful journey. I I am I'm, you know, I have a lot of work ahead, and you know, as as I as I said in the book many times, it's like one little step at a time. You know, sometimes it's two steps forwards, one step back, but I'm. You know, como buena Latina, I'm stubborn, and um, you know, <laughs> and it doesn't matter how long it's going to take me to to try to make this more inclusive. Yeah. So, how can we, comadres, uh, and anyone, be better allies to the LGBTQ community? Oh my God, what a beautiful question! And I have received this from a lot of younger Latina women. They get scared. They, a lot of them are afraid of, of, of pissing off or of really upsetting, you know, their moms, their aunts, their relatives. I, I would say it's just asking them about their lives. It's, it's just, I, I think 
you know, especially as comadres, I, I feel, you know, you have to earn the title comadre. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not something that you can just like tag it to yourself. I mean, there's so much wisdom being a comadre. And I would say the way of giving back to the younger generation is, is just, you know, this opportunity of allowing me to share my story of telling others, I think is, is just, um, you know, that, that's how we collaborate. You know, it's almost like building a bridge to each other. And, and I know, I mean, it's, you know, genera the younger generation, millennials and younger, you know, they get scared. Sometimes they, they, you know, there's so much happening and there's so much uncertainty and it, it is hard. I mean, it, it's been very fearful, especially with the last couple of years in the pandemic um, to, to gain your own agency. And I think it's just, you know, to keep an open mind, to let them know that, you know, we will love them regardless of who they are and not to, not to, you know, I mean, in my mom, in my mom's world, at the end, ideally, like, you know, for her to see me married with a guy and having kids, you know, would have been her biggest pride. But, but you know, I know deep in my heart, she's very proud of me. And, and I know, like, she's guiding me. She's here with me. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, I had the experience of having uh, one of my daughters, a documentary filmmaker, make a documentary about the relationship between my mother, who was more Catholic than the Pope, and my brother that was gay. And uh, through, through that the experience of making the movie, my, my daughter understood how I, was deal how I dealt with that situation with my brother. And I think um, it's, it's, uh, it's a documentary that, that won several awards and, and we use it after the uh, Pulse Massacre in, in Orlando as a, as a fundraiser and it, we had some really good conversations everywhere we went about the, the struggle that parents that have been raised in a different situation, in a different culture, have uh, dealing with, with issues of the LGBTQ community. So uh, that's something that I think I'm, I'm happy to, to work with and to uh, share with other people because mm -hmm. I think it's very important that, that uh, parents realize that, that there can be a growth and that, and that children can understand that parents are doing what they think is best for their kids. You know, like my mom wanted to save my brother's soul. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, how can you tell her that that was not the right way of doing it? Anyway. Um, yeah. Well, Linda, and, no, I'll tell you, I mean, if I can just quickly say, I think especially for us, I am a Catolica, you know, I, I'm a still, I mean, I'm, regardless of, of all my, and the complexities that I have, I still go to church pray a lot. And I think especially here, you know, in our communities that it's so important. And, and the Pope is being quite, you know, I mean, quite open-minded, but that hasn't always translate here in a lot of our churches. So that's mm -hmm. another opportunity as well to, to tell yeah. the priest being like, listen, you know what, even the Pope himself, I'm, I'm trying to get in the Spanish version of my book. So hopefully, you know, I... so uh, do you have a new mountain to climb, a new story to write? I would love to. Uh, I think uh, my next story would likely be my per my journey to sobriety. I now have been four years sober, and I would love to share. Uh, I didn't go through twelve steps. I went through something really powerful, which was learning how to. Um, I did these powerful meditations of self compassion, and I learned the powerful meaning of self compassion. So that I would that would be a massive. That would be my biggest inner mountain to share. So hopefully that is something that I, you know, we'll see if, if, if the universe and the Virgin allows me that opportunity, but, but that is something that I would love to bring forward. That is huge. And that would be very, very helpful to so many people. So yeah, it's a way of, of giving of yourself and your experience, you know, redeeming that pain that you went through yes. and, and making, making something good out of it. So I congratulate you on your courage. Thank Not you. only to climb out Everest, but to climb inside yourself and discover all these painful things that needed to be brought out and to share them with the world. It's not easy, you know, to, to write a memoir and to expose yourself and, and, and it's, but it's something that can help a lot of people. So uh, we're very proud of you and, and we really appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. Thank you so much. A las comadres. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much for this opportunity and for this time. I'm, I'm really honored and touched and thank you. It, it means the world to me. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Oh, gracias y bravo, comadres. Our second interview is with author Adriana Herrera, who was born and raised in the Caribbean, but for the last 15 years has let her job and her spouse take her all over the world. She loves writing stories about people who look and sound like her people, getting unapologetic happy endings. When she's not dreaming of love stories, planning logistically complex vacations with her family or hunting for discount Broadway tickets. She's a social worker in New York City, working with survivors of domestic and sexual violence. Interviewing Adriana is Comadre Maria Cardez. Maria, a Comadre for over 25 years, is a fashionpreneur and owner of Maria de Socorro Fashions. Take it away, Maria. Welcome, Adriana. For those who have um, not finished or started a Caribbean heiress in Paris, um, please give us a brief synopsis of the book. So Caribbean heiress in Paris is a historical romance and it's the first book in a series called Las Leonas. And it's set in 1889 at the Paris World's Fair. And it's um, three best friends who come to Paris for different reasons. There are three heiresses from the Caribbean. And the first one, um, heiress, Caribbean heiress in Paris, is um, about Lusalana. He's been signed. She's a Dominican woman whose family has owned a rum distillery for about 50 years. And her parents have both passed away. And she's been tasked. Um, with the job of expanding their rum um, market into the European market. So she gets there determined to like make, make a go of it and sell her rum. She knows her rum is good and she's, you know, ready to take on Paris. But when she gets there, no one wants to do business with her because she's a woman. And so she quickly realizes that she's going to need some allies. If she's going to um, be able to reach her goal, she's also... There's like a bit of a other like subplot of um, her inheritance not being available to her. So she finds an ally in James Evanton Sinclair, who is an Earl, a Scottish Earl, who's also a whiskey maker. And they realize that if they marry, they'll both be able to get what they want for their businesses. So they do, and then they fall in love. <laughs> okay, which Paris is definitely a romantic city. Yes. Why the exposition? Why make her a rum heiress? So, I mean, the exposition was because, I mean, like largely there's not a lot of historical romance. There is some romance, like there is some like historical fiction, like not romantic, that is like with Latin characters, but there's not a lot of historical romance with Latina characters in it. So I had to find a setting that um, historically, like was accurately historically, that historically accurate that I could have Latinas there. So um, a few years ago, I found an article, I'm from the Dominican Republic. So a few years ago, I found an article in a Dominican newspaper talking about the first time that the Dominican Republic um, exhibited at a World's Fair in France, and it was at the 1889 um, Exposition Universelle, which was the centennial of the revolution. And for that um, uh, exposition, France invited for the first time as independent nation, 13 Latin countries. So there were Bolivia, Peru, Chile, Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico, um, Dominican Republic, we're all there. So there's like a lot of historical information and archives around the presence of those countries at the exhibit. Each of the countries built a pavilion. There's maps, there's photographs of the pavilions at the exposition. And there's a lot of record of the people that came from Latin America as exhibitors, presenters that came as traders to do commerce there, about 5,500. Um, people from Latin America came that year as presenters and 32 million people came to Paris that year as visitors to see the exposition. So in terms of a setting, um, it was also the year that like the Eiffel Tower was debuted. It was like a big, it was like almost, you could say it was like the first truly global event 
like in history. So it was just like the perfect setting for me to do something where a lot of Latinx culture and presence was there because there's so much information that I had access to about it. So, which is very interesting because I'm assuming since you did all that research, um, how did you research the facts, how women in business were treated in that period, especially since Luz Alana was a, a, a woman of color? And, and did you research, you know, white women were treated as opposed to non-whites? Would, you know, would Luz Alana been totally defeated without the help of Evan Sinclair? You know, how did you research to how women, you know, because of course they had the challenge, women always had challenges, okay? But back then I could imagine, you know, how you described in your work. So you must've done great research in the fact that of course they were treated that way. Did and I mean the reality is that there was a lot of there's still a lot of difficulties around women be able to do like business in the world. But one of the lucky things for me is that um, there is a Dominican Studies Institute Institute here in New York City. I live in New York City at the City College, and I um, started working with the librarian there just to get a sense of what, in terms of Santo Domingo and the Dominican Republic, where I'm from and where Lusalana was from, what um, the second half of the uh, 19th century would have looked like for a woman who was doing business, right? So he was able to find me like amazing uh, resources. And one of the things he found for me was a, a listing, like a record of all the registered um, commerces and people who were in commerce in the Dominican Republic in the eastern part where she was from. And at the time that um, she, I was like the book is set about seven, seven out of 10 people selling liquor in Santo Domingo were women. So just from that um, kind of like piece of information and there was like women who had an, had had inherited money or women who women who were widows were able to do business as legal entities so for me i could i mean of course this is romance so i can i have some like liberties like i can take some fictional liberties but i i kind of like thought that i could kind of extrapolate that someone like Lusalana who had the means, who, who, had, who came from a family that had, had a lot of resources and with a long history of having this business could have come to um, the exposition to do business. And like I said, it wasn't just Latin America. There were about 35 countries there doing business. People who came as, um, you know, selling jewelry, selling timber, selling rum, selling all kinds of different things. So to me, it was the piece of like, it was plausible and viable for her to exist and to be doing that kind of business. And it was also like necessary possibly for her to not need to find an ally. And again, like <laughs> this is all like backstory because the story is the romance. Like these are all things that I kind of had to like use as my plot, but like the meat of the story is Luz and Evan falling in love. So, um, so I understand now how you were able to create your characters because you had all this, you know, history. So from all of that is how you created your characters, you know, to match them up and lose Alana from Dominican Republic. I guess, you know, you took your background from that, which was cool. And Evan as a Scottish Earl, you know, and, you know, and you figured directly how they would have met and then falling in love, even though they they would it was just a marriage of of convenience because they were going to help each other, um, which is really um, is is pretty fascinating. So I guess that explains you know you really did your research. Um, you didn't visit Paris. You just took all the did you visit Paris or you just took all your research from I... what you learned. I did, I actually, so I lived in Paris uh, for six months between high school and college, but that was a long time ago. But I actually, the reason, the, the time that I was, I found this article, I found this article in 2019 because I was researching, because I was going to Paris with my family, like the winter of 2020. So in January of 2020, I was going to go with my family to Paris for for a visit and that's why I was doing a little research and wh wherever I go I always research like Dominicans in so if I'm going to Greece 
I, I'll Google Dominicans in Greece, just in case something awesome is happening with Dominicans in the place <laughs> I'm going and I can go, go to a restaurant or do something. So I, I usually just research Dominicans wherever I'm going and I just Google Dominicans in Paris and I found this article randomly and that's how I got the idea. So I actually was in Paris that January and then I went back in it um, in November of last year too. We have friends there so it, um, we can go and stay with them um, for my research. <laughs> so I guess that helped, you know, because yes. you had a feel of it. You were there, yes. so you, you know, because in your in 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 your book, you know, you get the you get the feeling that if like if you were there, so of course you 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 put that in, um, and Lou Salana and Earl is a biracial couple. How important um, was it to write about a diverse couple? Would they have, you know, would they have faced the same prejudice in Europe back then in Britain or in the Caribbean? Or did, how did you come to that research? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I feel like, again, um, a lot of the historical romance that's available to us, it's really framed around um, like a very particular time and also like a very particular lens and gaze around like what history looked like, right? So there's not a lot of romance set in Europe with characters who are people of color, written by people of color. So for me, kind of like having been born and raised in the Dominican Republic, I left the DR when I was 23. So like I grew up there, all my family's there. And I had a very strong sense that Santo Domingo always, has always been a really global place and a place that geo, geographically and geopolitically, like the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Haiti, Cuba, are kind of like were for hundreds of years the gateway of the war of the West into like you know other parts of the world. Like we literally were like the throughway for Europe and Africa to come to the Americas. So it's always been a place where there's a lot of different cultures kind of like coming through, and interracial marriage was never illegal in, in, in that part of the world. Like in this country, yes, it was, but like interracial marriage for a lot of different reasons, many of which are not good, was never like something that was illegal. So biracial couples, interracial couples were something that was always something that was, that existed in the Caribbean, Spanish Caribbean, which is what I know mo most of because I am I'm from the DR. So to me, again, like I, ha I have to frame things and I have to use the lens of what is my history and not so much as how someone who perhaps has a different perception of what history looked like would write it, where they're gonna just like focus on, like to me, it would have made no sense to write a story about a Dominican woman and a Scottish person when I know that interracial marriage has always existed, where like the entire story was about her being Dominican and him being Scottish, when there were like a lot of other things that had, you know, that were there that was friction for their romance. And 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 that's why for um Evan, um, I made some choices around his own background, right? Like his 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 cousin was also biracial, like his uncle had gone to Jamaica and his wife was black. So he was someone who already had like family members who were biracial, like his cousin was his best friend. His, his business partner was Indian and, and gay. So like, to me, I had to make choices of like, I have to create a, a hero. I have to like write a hero who, I don't have to burden my heroine with explaining to him that the world is bigger than just like white people and the aristocracy. Like Evan was a man that already came into the book, into the story, into his like love story with Lusalana, being aware that the world was much bigger than just Scot Scotland, England, and the aristocracy. So that gave me the ability to like, build their romance around other things that wasn't like the racial thing or the the you know whatever and and Lusalana's biracial her dad was Scottish and and there is like I, I did probably too much research but among the research that I did was that I found that there were a few bankers 
in the Dominican Republic, starting in the 1850s, who came from Scotland. There was one particular family, the Reeds, that has been in the DR since the 1850s. So there is a world where there could have been a Scottish man that came to the Dominican Republic in the 1850s, married a woman whose family had a rum distillery, and they had a daughter who ended up going back to Scotland and marrying an earl, you know? So, so that to me is part of like what we do when we're in this space, right? Like what we do when we come in with our lens and our gaze, knowing that history is a lot more complex and nuanced than um, what we usually um, get to see in historical romance. And Evan's story was, was very responsive because the fact that he was ashamed of his own background because his people were very treacherous in what they did in the Caribbean. So he was kind of like embarrassed and 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 not what his father did. You know, his father was a traitor, or you know, I mean what he did to his mother. And then when he found out that his own brother was biracial, you know, and that made him like his world just like open up to find out that wow, you know, his own brother was biracial and he was like the one that helped him to 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 get back that to his father for what everything that he's done to his mother. Um, so it was like made him even more receptive of, of the diversity of what he was facing with Luz Alana. And I think he is, like you said, he was like the hero because he, he saw that how she was treated. And since he had already that, that, that sensitive background, he was, you know, he fell right into the fact that, you know, she's here trying to make a life of herself alone and that she's being treated that way. And so, I, I mean, I love that. The fact that you made him such, you know, the sensitive man, you know, as big and handsome or whatever, but that he his his art was like butter, you know, when it came to that, because he 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 lived the cruelty of what people could do. So I I thought that was very commendable how you did that story. Um, so it's 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 some you know your your research was really brilliant um, because the way you know reading it just covered how much. Like you said that you did too much. I don't think you did too much research and it was just perfect because you added in stuff that, I mean, I didn't even know about it. I said, I mean, I have read about it years and years ago and I totally forgot. So that's right. Women were in the markets. They were selling rum. They were making rum. They were doing all this stuff in the Caribbean. My mom used to tell me stories and I totally mm -hmm. forgot about that because it was so many years ago. And reading the book brought it all back. So, wow, I forgot that. That's right. So it was really fascinating. What I also found that was so comical and amusing is that you that you know, which us as Latinos do, and some of and some stuff you would put, you would throw in those Spanish, you know, te come mienda, and te cabrón, you know, and, you know that she's telling herself while she's thinking about him in her mind. It was that was so funny because that's exactly what we do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we face a confrontation with someone and, 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 you know, and we might be talking to them in English, but in, in, in our mind in Spanish, whatever, <laughs> because that's how we react, you know, we react to our anger and how we get our revenge because they can't hear it. So I thought that was so funny. I really, I really like, I really like that part. Good. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think part of it too, and, and, and they have a conversation about that in, in the book at some point where, um, you know, Evan is like, oh, I love it when you speak to me in Spanish because he thought it was very sexy. And she, and she corrected him and said, no, I don't speak Spanish. I speak Dominican Spanish. And she like explained to him that um, every, every country, you know, right, we got this language that was, yeah, we brought, was brought to us, but the Caribbean Spanish is not just Castilian, Caribbean Spanish is West African languages, it's Taino, it's exactly. a mixture of a lot of every culture that's like was like coming through those islands. And so, you know, the Spanish have their Spanish and we have ours. And so to me, it was really important to make the point that um, whatever reason it is that, you know, colonization happened and we were given this language, but it is ours now because it's Dominican Spanish, Puerto Rican Spanish, Cuban Spanish, it's its own thing. Exactly, exactly. Now, um, going back to your, ex your passionate, explicit love scenes. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read a book like this in a long time. 
And I have to admit, I said, whoa, you know, <laughs> I said, whoa, I forgot what that was like. And how did you, you know, is that from your experience? Because you were really, I mean, explicit. I mean, I was impressed of how explicit you were. So is that from your own experiences or from films? So how did, how did you do that? <laughs> I mean, I, I read a lot of romance and romance has like, you know, different kind of heat levels is what we call them, right? Like um, romance that's like really sweet where it's like closed door where people don't really have sex on the page. And then there's, you know, up all kinds of like other iterations. I like to read high heat romance. I like to read things that are super sexy, that are very descriptive. To me, I do a lot of my character work. I do a lot of like um, the kind of like love, like the sex scenes and like all like the intimacy pieces for me are really kind of like a device that I move the story forward usually. So to me, they're re they really are an integral part of of the love story itself, I personally like them. I love to write them. I love to read them. So to me, it's a really, I mean, it's like I said, like the reason why I get to this desk every morning is because I get to write books with sex scenes in them. Um, and so that's, that to me is, and also just like largely, again, it's, it's the reason why I write brown women. I write brown women, I write black women, I write Afro-Latinas. And, and part of what to me is important is to show these women and these bodies which have been hypersexualized, which have been commodified in so many ways in fiction and in media, and to really show them in a way where they are being like worshiped, loved, adored exactly as they are and like seen for who they are without being objectified. And to me, that's honestly like in terms culturally, like the way that we think about sex, the way that we think about women's pleasure in Latin culture has always been something that I've personally struggled a lot with as a bisexual woman. Like we don't talk about sex. Um, we don't explore our pressure, our pleasure. And to me, it's very important to do the work of rendering that not just as normal, but as like as an integral piece of love. And so that's why I write them very sexy, very spicy, because I think um, there's a lot of unlearning that we have to do in Latin culture as women about like what our bodies get to do and how our bodies get to serve us for our pleasure, right? So I think to me, that's, that's important work in my, my romance writing is having love scenes where women um, are worshipped and like where they are that when they find their pleasure and have agency in their pleasure. Um, the second book in this series is a lesbian romance. I'm writing it right now, and it's um, Manuela, who is um, one of the friends. She's an artist, and she's in, she's in a relationship with a duchess who is also Latina. And it's been really great to write that book. And again, it's that piece of being able to write women who are free and who can find love and be made love to in a way that is um, not objectifying them. So that to me, like there's the part that's fun. And then also to me, it's like an important part of my work as a romance writer. Which is great because it kind of like awakens, I mean, it awakened this mama, this old mama here. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's just like, it reminds you that you're a woman and you, you know, and you have so many elements, sexual elements that are there and you should, exactly, you should be free to express them. Um, so, which was really cool. You know, you write both contemporary and historical romances. Do you have a preference? Um... I mean, historical is a lot harder just because of the research that I have to do for it. And, and the, the dialogue, the vernacular, like I can't like with contemporary, I kind of just can write like I think now and I can like, like take from like popular culture right now and with historical, even though I'm writing about things that are current and relevant, like I have to like write them for audiences that are modern. It, it is harder just because the research is so much like even now with this um, with the story, which is a lesbian romance, Paris was very, very gay in the late 
1800s. The, the specifically the lesbian scene in Paris was extremely vibrant. Um, it wasn't illegal to be gay in Paris at that time. And so um, it was it was a very like fertile environment for women who want who had an interest to have a romantic partner to be in pretty openly be able to live with their partners. So it's been great writing it, but I've had to do a lot of research about the different types of places where women could socialize when they were, um, you know, trying to find or socialize with other women who were looking to meet women and the environment in Paris at that time. So it's great, but also like a ton of reading. That's great, that's great. Um, we have one, if anyone has questions, we're open for questions. Also, you already told us a little about your next, you know, cause you said like it's a, um, it's a series, right? And the yes. second one, is Manuela part of that, of the heiress book? Cause I know Manuela is in the book, or I don't, you know. Is, is it the same Manuela that's in the- Yes. Oh, that's cool. Yes. So it's the three, the, it's three um, heiresses who are best friends. They met at finishing school when they were like teenagers. So Manuela is, um, Aurora, Luzalana was the first one. And then Manuela is the second one. And Aurora is the last book. And Aurora is um, gonna be with Apollo, who is like a pretty important character in the first book. Yes, because Apollo's um, the brother that throw, you know, that walks everything up. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, so he, Apollo and Aurora are the last book, and that one's coming out in 2024, and Luz, Manuela and the Duchess of Sundridge, who is um, Chilean Bolivian, is coming out next year. That's, oh, so we'll really be looking forward to those. That sounds really cool. <laughs> it's really great. <laughs> Anyone with questions for Adriana? No, no questions. Well, thank you so much, Adriana. I mean, we've enjoyed, I mean, we really enjoyed your book. I have enjoyed it. It stirred me up. <laughs> <laughs> that, good, that's the, that's the mission. <laughs> that's the mission, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I love the history and everything. It was really, it was really well done. I have a question. No, we don't oh, have Maria time for Yes. Oh, when did you start writing? Um, How young were you? You seem young now. Well, I'm 44, so I'm youngish. Um, but I I started probably like writing to be published mid like 2015, 2016. And I've always written for myself, but a lot of it was like super queer fanfic <laughs> that no one can see now. It's like in the vault. <laughs> Nora? Our, okay. Our thanks to authors Sylvia Bas Vasquez Lavado and Adriana Herrera and their publishers, Henry Hull and Company and Harlequin Books for their generous donation of books by early registrants. Thank you to our interviewers as well, Comadres Nilia and Maria. And, and I must say, the two books were very, very different and portrayed the power of the Latina woman in such different ways, but they, they merge in the sense of the emergence of our own understanding of ourselves and of our power. We wanna thank our audience for taking the time to join us tonight, to those that submitted questions as well. And we'd like to thank all our volunteers without whom this book club and all the associated work would not happen. Mil gracias to all of you. Please remember to support our authors by writing a review of their books on sites like Amazon, Goodreads, Barnes yes. & Noble, and others. Those reviews carry weight with the publishers as well as with other readers. And buy those books to support our authors. And if your library doesn't have a book you want to read, ask them to order it. And please attend your virtual local book club meetings and bring a friend or two. Remember, our book club is open to men and women, Latinos and non-Latinos. All are welcome. Our September books are You Sound Like a White Girl, The Case for Rejecting Assimilation by Julissa Arce, and <laughs> Secret Identity by Alex Segura. Something About Grandma, Un Verano Especial con la Abuelita 
by Dania de Reguil. Again, thank you all for your continued support of our book club in Latino literature. And please join us in celebrating our quinceañero throughout the year by buying books and supporting Latino authors. Good night, and as always, read Latino literature. Thank you, everyone. Yay. Good night. <laughs>